Part three, chapter two of Madame Bovary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert. Translated by Eleanor Marx Aveling. Part three, chapter two. On reaching the inn, Madame Bovary was surprised not to see her diligence. Hiver, who had waited for her fifty-three minutes, had at last started. Yet nothing forced her to go, but she had given her word that she would return that same evening. Moreover, Charles expected her. And in her heart she felt already that cowardly docility, that is for some women at once chastisement and atonement for adultery. She packed her box quickly, paid her bill, took a cab in the yard, hurrying on the driver urging him on, every moment inquiring about the time and the miles traversed. He succeeded in catching up the hirondelle as it neared the first houses of Quincampoix. Hardly was she seated in her corner, and she closed her eyes, and opened them at the foot of the hill, when from afar she recognized Félicité, who was on the lookout in front of the farrier's shop. Hiver pulled in his horses, and the servant, climbing up to the window, said mysteriously, Madame, you must go at once to Monsieur Homais. It is for something important. The village was silent as usual. At the corner of the streets were small pink heaps that smoked in the air, for this was the time of jam making, and every one at Yonville prepared his supply on the same day. But in front of the chemist's shop, one might admire a far larger heap, and that surpassed the others with the superiority that a laboratory must have over ordinary stores. A general need over individual fancy. She went in. The large armchair was upset, and even the fanal de Rouen lay on the ground, outspread between two pestles. She pushed open the lobby door, and in the middle of the kitchen, amid brown jars full of picked currants, of powdered sugar and lump sugar, of the scales on the table and of the pans on the fire, she saw all the hommes, small and large, with aprons reaching to their chins and with forks in their hands. Justin was standing up with bowed head, and the chemist was screaming. Who told you to go and fetch it in the Capanaum? What is it? What's the matter? What is it? replied the druggist. We're making preserves. They're simmering, but they're about to boil over because there's too much juice, and I ordered another pan. Then he, from indolence, from laziness, went and took hanging on its nail in my laboratory the key of the Capanaum. It was thus the druggist called a small room under the leads, full of the utensils and the goods of his trade. He often spent long hours there alone, labelling, decanting and doing up again, and he looked upon it not as a simple store, but as a veritable sanctuary. Whence thereafter was issued, elaborated by his hands, all sorts of pills, Polyuses, infusions, lotions, and potions, that will bear far and wide his celebrity. Not one in the world set foot there, and he respected it so that he swept it himself. Finally, if the pharmacy, open to all comers, was the spot where he displayed his pride, the Kappa Noun was the refuge where, egoistically concentrating himself, Omer delighted in the exercise of his predilections so that Justin's thoughtlessness seemed to him a monstrous piece of irreverence. And, redder than the currents, he repeated, Yes, from the Capernaum, the key that locks up the assets and calls the alcalis. To go and get a spare pan, a pan with a lid, and that I shall perhaps never use. Everything is of importance in the delicate operations of our art. But devil take it, one must make distinctions and not employ for almost domestic purposes that which is meant for pharmaceutical. It is of one word to carve a fowl with a scalpel, as if a magistrate... Now be calm, said Madame Homer, and Athalie, pulling at his coat, cried, Papa, Papa! No, let me alone, went on the druggist. Let me alone. Hang it! My word! One might as well set up for a grocer. That's it. Go it. Respect nothing. Break, smash, let loose the leeches, burn the mallow paste, pickle the gherkins in the window jars, tear up the bandages. I thought you had, said Emma. Presently. Do you know to what you exposed yourself? 
Didn't you see anything in the corner on the left, on the third shelf? Speak, answer, articulate something. Uh, uh, I, I don't know, stammered the young fellow. Ah, you don't know. Well then, I do know. You saw a bottle of blue glass sealed with yellow wax that contains a white powder on which I've even written dangerous. And do you know what's in it? Arsenic! And you go and touch it. You take a pen that was next to it. Cried Madame Homais, clasping her hands. Arsenic! You might have poisoned us all! And the children began howling as if they already had frightful pains in their entrails. Or poison a patient, continued the druggist. Do you want to see me in the prisoner's dock with criminals, in a court of justice? To see me dragged to the scaffold? Don't you know what care I take in managing things, although I'm so thoroughly used to it? Often I'm horrified myself when I think of my responsibility. For the government persecutes us, and the absurd legislation that rules us is a veritable Damocles sword over our heads. Emma no longer dreamed of asking what they wanted her for, and the druggist went on in breathless phrases. That's your return for all the kindness we've shown you, and that's how you recompense me for really paternal care that I lavish on you, for without me where would you be? What will you be doing? Who we'll provides you with food, education, clothes, and all the means of figuring one day with honour in the ranks of society? But you must pull hard at the oar if you're to do that, and get, as people say, callosities upon your hands. Fabricando fit faber aga quod agis. He was so exasperated he quoted Latin. He would have quoted Chinese or Greenlandish had he known those two languages, for he was in one of those crises in which the whole soul shows indistinctly what it contains, like the ocean, which in the storm opens itself from the seaweeds on its shores down to the sound of his abysses. And he went on. I'm beginning to repent terribly of having taken you up. I should certainly have done better to have left you rotting your poverty and the dirt in which you were born. Oh, you'll never be fit for anything but to hurt animals with horns. You have no aptitude for science. You hardly know how to stick on a label. And there you are, dwelling with me, snug as a parson, living in clover, taking your ease. But Emma, turning to Madame Homais, I was told to come here. Oh, dear me, interrupted the good woman with a sad air. How am I to tell you? It's a misfortune. She could not finish. The druggist was thundering. Empty it, clean it, take it back, be quick! And seizing Justin by the collar of his blouse, took a book out of his pocket. The lad stooped, but Omer was the quicker, and, having picked up the volume, contemplated with staring eyes and open mouth. Conjugal love, he said, slowly separating the two words. Ah, very good, very good, very pretty. An illustration? Oh, this is too much. Madame Omer came forward. Do not touch it. The children wanted to look at the pictures. Leave the room, he said imperiously, and they went out. First he walked up and down with the open volume in his hand, rolling his eyes, choking, tumid, apoplectic, when he came straight to his pupil, and planting himself in front of him with crossed arms. Have you every vice, then, little wretch? Take care. You're on a downward path. Did you not reflect that this infamous book might fall in the hands of my children, candle a spark in their minds, tarnish the purity of Athelie, corrupt Napoleon? He is already formed like a man. Are you quite sure, anyhow, that they have not read it? Can you certify to me? But really, sir, said Emma, you wish to tell me... Ah, yes, madame, your father-in-law is dead. In fact... Monsieur Bovary Seigneur had expired the evening before, suddenly, from an attack of apoplexy. So he got up from the table, and, by way of greater precaution, on account of Emma's sensibility, Charles had begged Homer to break the horrible news to her gradually. Homer had thought over his speech. He had rounded, polished it, made it rhythmical. It was a masterpiece of prudence and transitions, of subtle turns and delicacy. But anger had got the better of rhetoric. Emma, giving up all chance of hearing any details, left the pharmacy, for Monsieur Homais had taken up the threat of his perturbations. However, he was growing calmer and was now grumbling in a paternal tone whilst he fanned himself with his skull cap. 
It's not that I entirely disapprove of the work. Its author was a doctor, but there are certain scientific points in it that is not ill a man should know. And I even would venture to say that a man must know. But later, later. At any rate, not till you're a man yourself and your temperament is formed. When Emma knocked at the door, Charles, who was waiting for her, came forward with her open arms and said to her with tears in his voice, Oh, my dear, and he bent over her gently to kiss her. But at the contact of his lips the memory of the other seized her, and she passed her hand over his face, shuddering. But she made answer, Yes, I know, I know. He showed her the letter in which his mother told the event, without any sentimental hypocrisy. She only regretted her husband had not received the consolations of religion, as he had died at Dordeville, in the street, at the door of a café, after a patriotic dinner with some ex-officers. Emma gave him back the letter. Then at dinner, for appearance's sake, she affected a certain repugnance. But as he urged her to try, she resolutely began eating, while Charles opposite her sat motionless in a dejected attitude. Now and then he raised his head and gave her a long look, full of distress. Once he sighed, I should have liked to see him again. She was silent. At last, understanding that she must say something, How old was your father? she asked. Fifty-eight. Ah. And that was all. A quarter of an hour after he added, But poor mother, what will become of her now? She made a gesture that signified she did not know. Seeing her so taciturn, Charles imagined her much affected and forced himself to say nothing, not to reawaken his sorrow which moved him. And, shaking off his own, Did you enjoy yourself yesterday? he asked. Yes. When the cloth was removed, Bovary did not rise, nor did Emma. And, as she looked at him, the monotony of the spectacle drove little by little all pity from her heart. He seemed to her paltry, weak, a cipher, in a word, a poor thing in every way. How to get rid of him? What an interminable evening! Something stupefying like the fumes of opium, says her. They heard in the passage the sharp noise of a wooden lock on the boards. It was Hippolyte bringing back Emma's luggage. In order to put it down, he described painfully a quarter of a circle with his stump. He doesn't even remember any more about it, she thought, looking at the poor devil whose coarse red hair was wet with perspiration. Bovary was searching at the bottom of his purse for a centime, and without appearing to understand all there was of humiliation for him in the mere presence of this man, who stood there like a personified reproach to his incurable incapacity. Hello. You've a pretty bouquet, he said, noticing Leon's violets on the chimney. Yes, she replied indifferently. It's a bouquet I bought just now from a beggar. Charles picked up the flowers, and, freshening his eyes, red with tears against them, smelt them delicately. She took them quickly from his hand and put them in a glass of water. The next day Madame Bovary Senior arrived. She and her son wept much. Emma, on the pretext of giving orders, disappeared. The following day they had a talk over the morning. They went and sat down with their workboxes by the waterside under the arbor. Charles was thinking of his father, and was surprised to feel so much affection for this man, whom till then he had thought he cared little about. Madame Bovary Senior was thinking of her husband. The worst days of the past seemed enviable to her. All was forgotten beneath the instinctive regret of such a long habit, and from time to time, whilst she sued, a big tear rolled along her nose and hung suspended there a moment. Emma was thinking that it was scarcely forty-eight hours since they had been together, far from all the world, all in a frenzy of joy and not having eyes enough to gaze upon each other. She tried to recall the slightest details of that past day, but the presence of her husband and mother-in-law worried her. She would have liked to hear nothing, to see nothing, so as not to disturb the meditation on her love, that, do what she would, 
became lost in external sensations. She was unpicking the linen of a dress, and the strips were scattered around her. Madame Bovary Signy was plying her scissor without looking up, and Charles, in his list slippers and his old brown surtout that he used as a dressing gown, sat with both hands in his pockets, and did not speak either. Near them, Berth, in a little white pinafore, was raking sand in the walks with a spade. Suddenly she saw Monsieur Lheureux, the linen draper, come in through the gate. He came to offer his services under the sad circumstances. Emma answered that she thought she could do without. The shopkeeper was not to be beaten. I beg your pardon, he said, but I should like to have a private talk with you. Then, in a low voice, it is about that affair, you know. Charles crimsoned to his ears. Oh, yes, certainly. And in his confusion, turning to his wife, couldn't you, my darling? She seemed to understand him, for she rose, and Charles said to his mother, "'It's nothing particular, no doubt some household trifle. He did not want her to know the story of the bill, fearing her approaches. As soon as they were alone, Monsieur Lheureux, in sufficiently clear terms, began to congratulate Emma on the inheritance, then to talk of indifferentness of the espalier of the harvest, and of his own health, which was always so-so, and having ups and downs. In fact, he had to work devilish hard, although he didn't make enough, in spite of all people said, to find butter for his bread. Emma let him talk on. She had bored herself so prodigiously the last two days. "'And so you're quite well again?' he went on. "'Ma foi! I saw your husband in a sad state. It's a good fellow, though we did have a little misunderstanding.' She asked what misunderstanding, for Charles had said nothing of the dispute about the goods supplied to her. "'Why, you know well enough,' cried Leroux. "'It was about your little fancies. The travelling trunks!' He had drawn his hat over his eyes, and, with his hands behind his back, smiling and whistling, he looked straight at her in an unbearable manner. Did he suspect anything? She was lost in all kinds of apprehensions. At last, however, he went on. We made it up all the same, and I've come again to propose another arrangement. This was to renew the bill Bovary had signed. The doctor, of course, would do as he pleased, and he was not to trouble himself, especially just now, when he would have a lot of worry. And he would do better to give it over to someone else. To you, for example, with the power of attorney, it could be easily managed, and then we, you and I, would have a little business transactions together. She didn't understand. He was silent. Then, passing to his trade, Leroux declared that Madame must require something. He would send her a black barrage, twelve yards, just enough to make a gown. The one you want is good enough for the house, but you want another for coals. I saw that the very moment that I came in. I have the eye of an American. He did not send the stuff. He brought it. Then he came again to measure it. He came again on other pretext, always trying to make himself agreeable, useful, enviving himself, as Omer would have said, and always dropping some hint to Emma about the power of attorney. He never mentioned the bill. She did not think of it. Charles, at the beginning of her convalescence had certainly said something about it to her, but so many emotions had passed through her head that she no longer remembered it. Besides, she took care not to talk of any money questions. Madame Bovary seemed surprised at this, and attributed the change in her ways to the religious sentiments that she had contracted during her illness. But, as soon as she was gone, Emma greatly astounded Bovary by her practical good sense would be necessary to make inquiries, to look into mortgages, and see if there were any occasion for sale by auction or liquidation. She quoted technical terms casually, pronounced the grand words of order, the future, foresight, and constantly exaggerated the difficulties of settling his father's affairs too much, that at last one day she showed him the rough draft of a power of attorney to manage and administer his business 
arrange all loans, sign and endorse all bills, pay all sums, etc. If you have profited by those lessons, Charles naively asked her where this paper came from. Monsieur Gaumion? And with the utmost coolness, she added, I don't trust him over much. Notaries have such a bad reputation. Perhaps we all do consult. We only know no one. Unless Leon, replied Charles, who was reflecting. But it was difficult to explain matters by letter. Then she offered to make the journey, but he thanked her. She insisted. It was quite a contest of mutual consideration. At last she cried with affected waywardness, No, I will go! How good you are, he said, kissing her forehead. The next morning she set out in the Hirondelle to go to Rouen to consure Monsieur Léon, and she stayed there three days. End of part three, chapter two. Part three, chapter three of Madame Bovelli. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Madame Bovelli by Gustave Flaubert, translated by Eleanor Marx Aveling. Part three, chapter three. They were three full, exquisite days, a true honeymoon. They were at the Hotel de Bologne on the harbor, and they lived there with drawn blinds and closed doors, with flowers on the floor, and iced syrups were brought them early in the morning. Towards evening they took a covered boat and went to dine on one of the islands. It was the time when one hears by the side of the dockyard the caulking mallets sounding against the hull of vessels. The smoke of the tar rose up between the trees. There were large fatty drops on the water, undulating in the purple color of the sun like floating plaques of Florentine bronze. They rowed down in the midst of moored boats whose long oblique cables grazed lightly against the bottom of the boat. The din of the town gradually grew distant, the rolling of carriages, the tumult of voices, the yelping of dogs on the decks of vessels. She took off her bonnet and they landed on their island. They sat down in the low-ceilinged room of a tavern at whose door hung black nets. They ate fried smelts, cream, and cherries. They lay down upon the grass, they kissed behind the poplars, and they would fain, like two Robinsons, have lived forever in this little place which seemed to them, in their beatitude, the most magnificent on earth. It was not the first time that they had seen trees, a blue sky, meadows, that they had heard the water flowing and the wind blowing in the leaves, but, no doubt, they had never admired all this, as if nature had not existed before, or had only begun to be beautiful since the gratification of their desires. At night they returned. The boat glided along the shores of the islands. They sat at the bottom, both hidden by the shade, in silence. The square oars rang in the iron thwarts, and in the stillness seemed to mark time like the beating of a metronome, while at the stern the rudder that trailed behind never ceased its gentle splash against the water. Once the moon rose, they did not fail to make fine phrases, finding the orb melancholy and full of poetry, she even began to sing. One night, do you remember, we were sailing, etc. Her musical but weak voice died away along the waves, and the winds carried off the trills that Leon heard pass like the flapping of wings about him. She was opposite him, leaning against the partition of the shallop, through one of whose raised blinds the moon streamed in. 
her black dress whose drapery spread out like a fan made her seem more slender taller her head was raised her hands clasped her eyes turned towards heaven at times the shadow of the willows hid her completely then she reappeared suddenly like a vision in the moonlight leon on the floor by her side found under his hand a ribbon of scarlet silk the boatman looked at it and at last said uh, perhaps it belongs to the party i took out the other day a lot of jolly folk gentlemen and ladies with cakes champagne coronets everything in style there was one especially a tall handsome man with small moustaches who was that funny and they all kept saying now tell us something adolphe dolpe i think she shivered are you in pain asked leon coming closer to her oh it's nothing no doubt it is only the night air and who doesn't want for women either softly added the sailor thinking he was paying the stranger a compliment then spinning on his hands he took the oars again yet they had to part the adieus were sad he was to send his letters to Mare Rollet, and she gave him such precise instructions about a double envelope that he admired greatly her amorous astuteness. So you can assure me it is all right? she said with her last kiss. Yes, certainly. But why, he thought afterwards as he came back through the streets alone, is she so very anxious to get this power of attorney? End of Part 3, Chapter 3 This recording by Aaron Elliott, St. Louis, Missouri Part 3, Chapter 4 of Madame Bovary This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert Translated by Eleanor Marks Aveling. Part 3. Chapter 4. Leon soon put on an air of superiority before his comrades, avoided their company, and completely neglected his work. He waited for her letters. He re-read them. He wrote to her. He called her to mind with all the strength of his desires and of his memories. Instead of lessening with absence, this longing to see her again grew, so that at last on Saturday morning he escaped from his office. When, from the summit of the hill, he saw in the valley below the church spire with its tin flag swinging in the wind, he felt that delight mingled with triumphant vanity and egoistic tenderness that millionaires must experience when they come back to their native village. He went rambling round her house. A light was burning in the kitchen. He watched for her shadow behind the curtains, but nothing appeared. Mère Lefrançois, when she saw him, uttered many exclamations. She thought he had grown and was thinner, while Artemis, on the contrary, thought him stouter and darker. He dined in the little room as of yore, but alone, without the tax-gatherer, for Binet, tired of waiting for the hirondelle, had definitely put forward his meal one hour, and now he dined punctually at five, and yet he declared usually the rickety old's concern was late. Leon, however, made up his mind and knocked at the doctor's door. Madame was in her room, and did not come down for a quarter of an hour. The doctor seemed delighted to see him, but he never stirred out that evening, nor all the next day. He saw her alone in the evening, very late, behind the garden in the lane, in the lane, as she had the other one. It was a stormy night and they talked under an umbrella by lightning flashes. Their separation was becoming intolerable. "'I would rather die,' said Emma. She was writhing in his arms, weeping. "'Adieu, adieu! When shall I see you again?' They came back again to embrace once more, and it was then that she promised him to find soon, by no matter what means, a regular opportunity for seeing one another in freedom at least once a week." Emma never doubted she should be able to do this. Besides, she was full of hope. Some money was coming to her. On the strength of it, she bought a pair of yellow curtains with large stripes for her room, whose cheapness Monsieur Lheureux had commanded. She dreamt of getting a carpet, 
and Lheureux, declaring that it wasn't drinking the sea, politely undertook to supply her with one. She could no longer do without his services. Twenty times a day she sent for him, and he, at once, put by his business without a murmur. People could not understand either why Mère Rollet breakfasted with her every day, and even paid her private visits. It was about this time, that is to say the beginning of winter, that she seemed seized with great musical fervour. One evening, when Charles was listening to her, she began the same piece four times over, each time with much vexation, while he, not noticing any difference, cried, "'Bravo! Very good! You are wrong to stop. Go on!' "'Oh, no, it is execrable. My fingers are quite rusty.' The next day he begged her to play him something again. "'Very well, to please you.' And Charles confessed she had gone off a little. She played wrong notes and blundered. Then, stopping short, oh, "'It is no use. I ought to take some lessons, but—' She bit her lips and added, Twenty francs a lesson, that's too dear.' "'Yes, so it is. Rather.' said Charles, giggling stupidly. But it seems to me that one might be able to do it for less, for they are artists of no reputation, and who are often better than the celebrities. Find them, said Emma. The next day, when he came home, he looked at her shyly, and at last could no longer keep back the words. How obstinate you are sometimes! I went to Barfuchère today. Well, Madame Liégeard assured me that her three young ladies, who are at La Miséricorde, have lessons at fifty sous apiece, and that from an excellent mistress. She shrugged her shoulders and did not open her piano again, but when she passed by it, if Bovary were there, she sighed, Ah, oh, my poor piano! And when any one came to see her, she did not fail to inform them she had given up music, and could not begin again now for important reasons. Then people commiserated her. What a pity! She had so much talent! They even spoke to Bovary about it. They put him to shame, and especially the chemist. You are wrong. One should never let any of the faculties of nature lie fallow. Besides, just think, my good friend, that by inducing Madame to study, you are economizing on the subsequent musical education of your child. For my own part, I think that mothers ought themselves to instruct their children. That is an idea of Rousseau's, still rather new, perhaps, but that will end up by triumphing, I am certain of it, like mothers nursing their own children and vaccination. So Charles returned once more to this question of the piano. Emma replied bitterly that it would be better to sell it. This poor piano that had given her vanity so much satisfaction. To see it go was to Bovary like the indefinable suicide of a part of herself. If you liked, he said, a lesson from time to time, that wouldn't after all be very ruinous. But lessons, she replied, are only of use when followed up. And thus it was she set about obtaining her husband's permission to go to town once a week to see her lover. At the end of a month, she was even considered to have made considerable progress. End of part three, chapter four. Recording by Ezwa in Belgium in January 2008. Part Three, Chapter Five of Madame Bovary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Sage. Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert. Part Three, Chapter Five. She went on Thursdays. She got up and dressed silently, in order not to awaken Charles, who would have made remarks about her getting ready too early. Next she walked up and down, went to the windows, and looked out at the place. The early dawn was broadening between the pillars of the market, and the chemist's shop, with the shutters still up, showed in the pale light of the dawn the large letters of his signboard. When the clock pointed to a quarter past seven, she went off to the Lyon d'Or, whose door Artemise opened yawning. The girl then made up the coals, covered by the cinders, and Emma remained alone in the kitchen. Now and again she went out. Hiver was leisurely harnessing his horses, listening, moreover, to Mère Lefrançois, 
who, passing her head and nightcap through a grating, was charging him with commissions and giving him explanations that would have confused anyone else. Emma kept beating the soles of her boots against the pavement of the yard. At last, when he had eaten his soup, put on his cloak, lighted his pipe, and grasped his whip, he calmly installed himself on his seat. The hirondelle started at a slow trot, and for about a mile stopped here and there to pick up passengers who waited for it, standing at the border of the road, in front of their yard gates. Those who had secured seats the evening before kept it waiting. Some even were still in bed in their houses. Hiver called, shouted, swore. Then he got down from his seat and went and knocked loudly at the doors. The wind blew through the cracked windows. The four seats, however, filled up. The carriage rolled off. Rows of apple trees followed one upon another, and the road between its two long ditches, full of yellow water, rose constantly, narrowing towards the horizon. Emma knew it from end to end. She knew that after a meadow there was a signpost, next an elm, a barn, or a hut of a lime-kiln tender. Sometimes even, in the hope of getting some surprise, she shut her eyes, but she never lost the clear perception of the distance to be traversed. At last the brick houses began to follow one another more closely. The earth resounded beneath the wheels. The hirondelle glided between the gardens, where, through an opening, one saw statues, a periwinkle plant, clipped yews, and a swing. Then, on a sudden, the town appeared, sloping down like an amphitheater, and drowned in the fog. It widened out beyond the bridges, confusedly. Then the open country spread away with a monotonous movement, till it touched in the distance the vague line of the pale sky. Seen thus from above, the whole landscape looked immovable as a picture. The anchored ships were massed in one corner, the river curved round the foot of the green hills, and the isles, oblique in shape, lay on the water like large, motionless black fishes. The factory chimneys belched forth immense brown fumes that were blown away at the top. One heard the rumbling of the foundries, together with the clear chimes of the churches that stood out in the mist. The leafless trees on the boulevards made violet thickets in the midst of the houses, and the roofs, all shining with the rain, threw back unequal reflections according to the height of the quarters in which they were. Sometimes a gust of wind drove the clouds toward the St. Catherine Hills, like aerial waves that broke silently against a cliff. A giddiness seemed to her to detach itself from this mass of existence, and her heart swelled as if the hundred and twenty thousand souls that palpitated there had all at once sent into it the vapor of the passions she fancied theirs. Her love grew in the presence of this vastness, and expanded with tumult to the vague murmurings that rose towards her. She poured it out upon the square, on the walks, on the streets, and the old Norman city outspread before her eyes as an enormous capital, as a Babylon into which she was entering. She leant with both hands against the window, drinking in the breeze. The three horses galloped, the stones grated in the mud, the diligence rocked, and Hiver, from afar, hailed the carts on the road, while the bourgeois, who had spent the night at Guillaume Woods, came quietly down the hill in their little family carriages. They stopped at the barrier. Emma undid her overshoes, put on other gloves, rearranged her shawl, and some twenty paces further she got down from the hirondelle. The town was then awakening. Shop boys in caps were cleaning up the shop fronts, and women with baskets against their hips, at intervals uttered sonorous cries at the corners of streets. She walked with downcast eyes close to the walls and smiling with pleasure under her lowered black veil. For fear of being seen, she did not usually take the most direct road. She plunged into dark alleys and, all perspiring, reached the bottom of the Rue Nationale near the fountain that stands there. It is the quarter for theatres, public houses, and whores. Often a cart would pass near her, bearing some shaky sceneries. 
Waiters in aprons were sprinkling sand on the flagstones between green shrubs. It all smelt of absinthe, cigars, and oysters. She turned down a street. She recognized him by his curling hair that escaped from beneath his hat. Leon walked along the pavement. She followed him to the hotel. He went up, opened the door, entered. What an embrace! Then, after the kisses, the words gushed forth. They told each other the sorrows of the week, the presentiments, the anxiety for the letters. But now everything was forgotten. They gazed into each other's faces with voluptuous laughs and tender names. The bed was large, of mahogany, in the shape of a boat. The curtains were in red levantine, that hung from the ceiling and bulged out too much towards the bell-shaped bedside. And nothing in the world was so lovely as her brown head and white skin standing out against this purple color, when, with a movement of shame, she crossed her bare arms, hiding her face in her hands. The warm room, with its discreet carpet, its gay ornaments, and its calm light, seemed made for the intimacies of passion, the curtain-rods ending in arrows, their brass pegs, and the great bowls of the fire-dogs shone suddenly when the sun came in. On the chimney, between the candelabra, there were two of those pink shells in which one hears the murmur of the sea, if one holds them to the ear. They loved that dear room, so full of gaiety, despite its rather faded splendor. They always found the furniture in the same place, and sometimes hairpins that she had forgotten the Thursday before under the pedestal of the clock. They lunched by the fireside on a little round table inlaid with rosewood, Emma carved, put bits on his plate with all sorts of coquettish ways, and she laughed with a sonorous and libertine laugh when the froth of the champagne ran over from the glass to the rings on her fingers. They were so completely lost in the possession of each other that they thought themselves in their own house, and they would live there till death, like two spouses, eternally young. They said, our room, our carpet. She even said, my slippers, a gift of Leon's, a whim she had had. They were pink satin, bordered with swan's down. When she sat on his knees, her legs, then too short, hung in the air, and the dainty shoe that had no back to it, was held only by the toes to her bare foot. He for the first time enjoyed the inexpressible delicacy of feminine refinements. He had never met this grace of language, this reserve of clothing, these poses of the weary dove. He admired the exultation of her soul and the lace on her petticoat. Besides, was she not a lady and a married woman, a real mistress in fine? By the diversity of her humor, in turn mystical or mirthful, talkative, taciturn, passionate, careless, she awakened in him a thousand desires, called up instincts or memories. She was the mistress of all the novels, the heroine of all the dramas, the vague she of all the volumes of verse. He found again on her shoulder the amber coloring of the odalisque bathing. She had the long waist of feudal chatelaines, and she resembled the pale woman of Barcelona. But above all, she was the angel. Often looking at her, it seemed to him that his soul, escaping towards her, spread like a wave about the outline of her head, and descended, drawn down into the whiteness of her breast. He knelt on the ground before her, and with both elbows on her knees, looked at her with a smile his face upturned. She bent over him and murmured, as if choking with intoxication, Oh, don't move! Do not speak! Look at me! Something so sweet comes from your eyes that helps me so much! She called him child. Child, do you love me? And she did not listen for his answer in the haste of her lips that fastened to his mouth. On the clock there was a bronze Cupid, who smirked as he bent his arms beneath a golden garland. They had laughed at it many a time, but when they had to part, everything seemed serious to them. Motionless in front of each other, they kept repeating, Till Thursday, till Thursday. Suddenly she seized his head between her hands, kissed him hurriedly on the forehead, crying adieu, and rushed down the stairs. She went to a hairdresser's in the Rue de la Comédie to have her hair arranged. 
Night fell. The gas was lighted in the shop. She heard the bell at the theatre calling the mummers to the performance, and she saw, passing opposite, men with white faces and women in faded gowns going in at the stage door. It was hot in the room, small and too low, where the stove was hissing in the midst of wigs and pomades. The smell of the tongs, together with the greasy hands that handled her head, soon stunned her, and she dozed a little in her wrapper. Often, as he did her hair, the man offered her tickets for a masked ball. Then she went away. She went up the streets, reached the Croix Rouge, put on her overshoes that she had hidden in the morning under the seat, and sank into her place among the impatient passengers. Some got out at the foot of the hill. She remained alone in the carriage. At every turning, all the lights of the town were seen more and more completely, making a great luminous vapor about the dim houses. Emma knelt on the cushions, and her eyes wandered over the dazzling light. She sobbed, called on Leon, sent him tender words and kisses lost in the wind. On the hillside a poor devil wandered about with his stick in the midst of the diligences. A mass of rags covered his shoulder, and an old, staved-in beaver, turned out like a basin, hid his face. But when he took it off, he discovered, in the place of eyelids, empty and bloody orbits. The flesh hung in red shreds, and there flowed from it liquids that congealed into green scale down to the nose, whose black nostrils sniffed convulsively. To speak to you, he threw back his head with an idiotic laugh. Then his bluish eyeballs, rolling constantly at the temples, beat against the edge of the open wound. He sang a little song as he followed the carriages. Maids and the warmth of a summer day dream of love and of love always. And all the rest was about birds and sunshine and green leaves. Sometimes he appeared suddenly behind Emma, bareheaded, and she drew back with a cry. Hiver made fun of him. He would advise him to get a booth at the Saint-Romain, fair, or else ask him, laughing, how his young woman was. Often they had started when, with a sudden movement, his hat entered the diligence through the small window, while he clung with his other arm to the footboard, between the wheels splashing mud. His voice, feeble at first and quavering, grew sharp. It resounded in the night like the indistinct moan of a vague distress, and through the ringing of the bells, the murmur of the trees, and the rumbling of the empty vehicle, it had a far-off sound that disturbed Emma. It went to the bottom of her soul like a whirlwind in an abyss, and carried her away into the distances of a boundless melancholy. But Hiver, noticing a weight behind, gave the blind man sharp cuts with his whip, the thong lashed his wounds, and he fell back into the mud with a yell. Then the passengers in the hirondelle ended by falling asleep, some with open mouths, others with lowered chins, leaning against their neighbor's shoulder, or with their arm passed through the strap, oscillating regularly with the jolting of the carriage and the reflection of the lantern swinging without on the crupper of the wheeler. Penetrating into the interior through the chocolate calico curtains grew sanguineous shadows over all these motionless people. Emma, drunk with grief, shivered in her clothes, feeling her feet grow colder and colder and death in her soul. Charles at home was waiting for her. The hirondelle was always late on Thursdays. Madame arrived at last and scarcely kissed the child. The dinner was not ready. No matter. She excused the servant. This girl now seemed allowed to do just as she liked. Often her husband, noting her pallor, asked if she were unwell. No, said Emma. But, he replied, you seem so strange this evening. Oh, it's nothing, nothing. They were even days when she had no sooner come in than she went up to her room, and Justin, happening to be there, moved about noiselessly, quicker at helping her than the best of maids. He put the matches ready, the candlestick, a book, arranged her nightgown, turned back the bedclothes. Come, she said, that will do. Now you can go. For he stood there, his hands hanging down and his eyes wide open, as if enmeshed in the innumerable threads of a sudden reverie. The following day was frightful, and those that came after still more unbearable. 
because of her impatience to once again seize her happiness, an ardent lust inflamed by the images of past experience, and that burst forth freely on the seventh day beneath Leon's caresses. His ardors were hidden beneath outbursts of wonder and gratitude. Emma tasted this love in a discreet, absorbed fashion, maintained it by all the artifices of her tenderness, and trembled a little lest it should be lost later on. She often said to him with her sweet, melancholy voice, Ah, you too will leave me. You will marry. You will be like all the others. He asked, What others? Why, like men, she replied, then added, repulsing him with a languid movement, You are all evil. One day, as they were talking philosophically of earthly disillusions, to experiment on his jealousy, or yielding perhaps to an overstrong need to pour out her heart, she told him that formerly, before him, she had loved someone. Not like you, she went on quickly, protesting by the head of her child that nothing had passed between them. The young man believed her, but none the less questioned her to find out what he was. He was a ship's captain, my dear. Was this not preventing any inquiry, and, at the same time, assuming a higher ground, through this pretended fascination exercised over a man who must have been of warlike nature and accustomed to receive homage? The clerk then felt the lowliness of his position. He longed for epaulets, crosses, titles, all that would please her. He gathered that from her spendthrift habits. Emma nevertheless concealed many of these extravagant fancies, such as her wish to have a blue tilbury to drive into Rouen, drawn by an English horse and driven by a groom in top-boots. It was Justin who had inspired her with this whim, by begging her to take him into her service as valet de chambre, and if the privation of it did not lessen the pleasure of her arrival at each rendezvous, it certainly augmented the bitterness of the return. Often, when they talked together of Paris, she ended by murmuring, Ah, how happy we should be there. Are we not happy? gently answered the young man, passing his hands over her hair. Yes, that's true, she said. I am mad. Kiss me. To her husband she was more charming than ever. She made him pistachio creams and played him waltzes after dinner so he thought himself the most fortunate of men, and Emma was without uneasiness, when, one evening suddenly, he said, "'It is Mademoiselle L'Empereur, isn't it, who gives you lessons?' "'Yes.' "'Well, I saw her just now,' Charles went on, "'at Madame Ligère. I spoke to her about you, and she doesn't know you.' This was like a thunderclap. However, she replied quite naturally, "'Ah!' No doubt she forgot my name. But perhaps, said the doctor, there are several demoiselles, l'empereur at Rouen, who are music mistresses. Possibly. Then quickly. But I have my receipts. Here, see. And she went to the writing table, ransacked all the drawers, rummaged the papers, and at last lost her head so completely that Charles earnestly begged her not to take so much trouble about those wretched receipts. Oh, I will find them, she said. And in fact, on the following Friday, as Charles was putting on one of his boots in the dark cabinet where his clothes were kept, he felt a piece of paper between the leather and his sock. He took it out and read, Received for three months' lessons and several pieces of music, the sum of sixty-three francs. Felicie, l'empereur, professor of music. How the devil did it get into my boots? It must, she replied, have fallen from the old box of bills that is on the edge of the shelf. From that moment her existence was but one long tissue of lies, in which she enveloped her love as in veils to hide it. It was a want, a mania, a pleasure carried to such an extent that if she said she had the day before walked on the right side of a road, one might know she had taken the left. One morning, when she had gone, as usual, rather lightly clothed, it suddenly began to snow, and as Charles was watching the weather from the window, he caught sight of Monsieur Bonnissien in the chaise of Monsieur Touvache, who was driving him to Rouen. Then he went down to give the priest a thick shawl that he was to hand over to Emma 
as soon as he reached the Croix Rouge. When he got to the inn, Monsieur Bournessin asked for the wife of the Yonville doctor. The landlady replied that she very rarely came to her establishment. So that evening, when he recognized Madame Bovary in the Hirondelle, the cure told her his dilemma without, however, appearing to attach much importance to it, for he began praising a preacher who was doing wonders at the cathedral, and whom all the ladies were rushing to hear. Still, if he did not ask for an explanation, others, later on, might prove less discreet. So she thought well to get down each time at the Croix Rouge, so that the good folk of her village, who saw her on the stairs, should suspect nothing. One day, however, Monsieur Lheureux met her coming out of the Hotel de Boulogne on Lyon's arm, and she was frightened, thinking he would gossip. He was not such a fool, but three days after he came to her room, shut the door, and said, I must have some money. She declared she could not give him any. Lheureux burst into lamentations, and reminded her of all the kindnesses he had shown her. In fact, of the two bills signed by Charles, Emma, up to the present, had paid only one. As to the second, the shopkeeper, at her request, had consented to replace it by another, which again had been renewed for a long date. Then he drew from his pocket a list of goods not paid for, to wit, the curtains, the carpet, the material for the armchairs, several dresses, the diverse articles of dress the bills for which amounted to about two thousand francs. She bowed her head. He went on. But if you haven't any ready money, you have an estate. And he reminded her of a miserable little hovel situated at Bonville, near Aumal, that brought in almost nothing. It had formerly been part of a small farm sold by Monsieur Bovary Sr., for Lheureux knew everything, even to the number of acres, and the names of the neighbors. If I were in your place, he said, I should clear myself of my debts and have money left over. She pointed out the difficulty of getting a purchaser. He held out the hope of finding one, but she asked him how she should manage to sell it. Haven't you the power of attorney? he replied. The phrase came to her like a breath of fresh air. Leave me the bill, said Emma. Oh, it isn't worth while, said Lheureux. He came back the following week, and boasted of having, after much trouble, at last discovered a certain Langrois, who for a long time had had an eye on the property, but without mentioning his price. "'Never mind the price,' she cried. But they would, on the contrary, have to wait to sound the fellow. The thing was worth a journey, and as she could not undertake it, he offered to go to the place to have an interview with Langrois. On his return, he announced that the purchaser proposed four thousand francs. Emma was radiant at the news. Frankly, he added, that's a good price. She drew the half sum at once, and when she was about to pay her account, the shopkeeper said, It really grieves me, on my word, to see you depriving yourself all at once of such a big sum as that. Then she looked at the bank notes, and dreaming of the unlimited number of rendezvous represented by those two thousand francs, she stammered, What? What? Oh, he went on, laughing good-naturedly, one puts anything one likes on receipts. Don't you think I know what household affairs are? And he looked at her fixedly, while in his hand he held two long papers that he slid between his nails. At last, opening his pocket-book, he spread out on the table four bills to order, each for a thousand francs. Sign these, he said, and keep it all. She cried out, scandalized. But if I give you the surplus, replies Monsieur Lheureux imprudently, is that not helping you? And taking a pen, he wrote at the bottom of the account, received of Madame Bovary four thousand francs. Now who can trouble you, since in six months you'll draw the arrears for your cottage, and I don't make the last bill due till after you've been paid? Emma grew rather confused in her calculations, and her ears tingled as if gold pieces, bursting from their bags, rang all round on the floor. At last Lheureux explained that he had a very good friend, Vincard, a broker at Rouen, who would discount these four bills. Then he himself would hand over to Madame the remainder 
after the actual debt was paid. But instead of two thousand francs, he brought only eighteen hundred, for the friend, Vincar, which was only fair, had deducted two hundred francs for commission and discount. Then he carelessly asked for a receipt. You understand, in business, sometimes, and, and with the date, if you please, with the date. A horizon of realizable whims opened out before Emma. She was prudent enough to lay by a thousand crowns with which the first three bills were paid when they fell due. But the fourth, by chance, came to the house on a Thursday, and Charles, quite upset, patiently awaited his wife's return for an explanation. If she had not told him about this bill, it was only to spare him such domestic worries. She sat on his knees, caressed him, cooed to him, gave him a long enumeration of all the indispensable things that had been got on credit. Really, you must confess, considering the quantity, it isn't too dear. Charles, at his wit's end, soon had recourse to the eternal Lure who swore he would arrange matters if the doctor would sign him two bills, one of which was for seven hundred francs, payable in three months. In order to arrange for this, he wrote his mother a pathetic letter. Instead of sending a reply, she came herself, and when Emma wanted to know whether he had got anything out of her, yes, he replied, but she wants to see the account. The next morning, at daybreak, Emma ran to Lheureux to beg him to make out another account for not more than a thousand francs, for to show the one for four thousand, it would be necessary to say that she had paid two-thirds and confess, consequently, the sale of the estate. A negotiation admirably carried out by the shopkeeper, and which, in fact, was only actually known later on. Despite the low price of each article, Madame Bovary Sr., of course, thought the expenditure extravagant. Couldn't you do without a carpet? Why have recovered the armchairs? In my time, there was a single armchair in a house for elderly persons. At any rate, it was so at my mother's, who was a good woman, I can tell you. Everybody can't be rich. No fortune can hold out against waste. I should be ashamed to coddle myself as you do, and yet I am old. I need looking after. And there, there, fitting up gowns, falals. What? Silk for lining at two francs? When you can get jaconet for ten sous or even for eight? That would do well enough? Emma, lying on a lounge, replied as quietly as possible. Ah, madame, enough, enough. The other went on lecturing her, predicting they would end in the workhouse, but it was Bovary's fault. Luckily he had promised to destroy the power of attorney. What? Ah, he swore he would, went on the good woman. Emma opened the window, called Charles, and the poor fellow was obliged to confess the promise torn from him by his mother. Emma disappeared, then came back quickly, and majestically handed her a thick piece of paper. Thank you, said the old woman, and she threw the power of attorney into the fire. Emma began to laugh, a strident, piercing, continuous laugh. She had an attack of hysterics. Oh, my God, cried Charles. Ah, you really are wrong. You came here and make scenes with her. His mother, shrugging her shoulders, declared it was all put on. But Charles, rebelling for the first time, took his wife's part so that Madame Bovary Sr. said she would leave. She went the very next day, and on the threshold, as he was trying to detain her, she replied, No, no, you love her better than me, and you're right. It's natural. For the rest, so much the worse. You'll see. Good day, for I am not likely to come soon again, as you say, to make scenes. Charles, nevertheless, was very crestfallen before Emma who did not hide the resentment she still felt at his want of confidence, and it needed many prayers before she would consent to have another power of attorney. He even accompanied her to Monsieur Guillamin to have a second one, just like the other, drawn up. "'I understand,' said the notary. "'A man of science can't be worried with the practical details of life.' And Charles felt relieved by this comfortable reflection, which gave his weakness the flattering appearance of higher preoccupation." And what an outburst the next Thursday at the hotel in their room with Leon. She laughed, cried, sang, sent for sherbets, 
wanted to smoke cigarettes seemed to him wild and extravagant, but adorable, superb. He did not know what recreation of her whole being drove her more and more to plunge into the pleasures of life. She was becoming irritable, greedy, voluptuous, and she walked about the streets with him, carrying her head high, without fear, so she said, of compromising herself. At times, however, Emma shuddered at the sudden thought of meeting Rodolphe, for it seemed to her that, although they were separated forever, she was not completely free from her subjugation to him. One night she did not return to Yonville at all. Charles lost his head with anxiety, and little Bertha would not go to bed without her mamma, and sobbed enough to break her heart. Justin had gone out searching the road at random. Monsieur Homais even had left his pharmacy. At last, at eleven o'clock, able to bear it no longer, Charles harnessed his chaise, jumped in, whipped up his horse, and reached the Croix Rouge about two o'clock in the morning. No one there. He thought that the clerk had perhaps seen her, but where did he live? Happily, Charles remembered his employer's address and rushed off there. Day was breaking, and he could distinguish the escutcheons over the door and knocked. Someone, without opening the door, shouted out the required information, adding a few insults to those who disturb people in the middle of the night. The house, inhabited by the clerk, had neither bell, knocker, nor porter. Charles knocked loudly at the shutters with his hands. A policeman happened to pass by. Then he was frightened and went away. I'm mad, he said. No doubt they kept her to dinner at Monsieur Lormeux, but the Lormeux no longer lived at Rouen. She probably stayed to look after Madame Dubreuil. Why, Madame Dubreuil has been dead these ten months. Where can she be? An idea occurred to him. At a café he asked for a directory, and hurriedly looked for the name of Mademoiselle L'Empereur, who lived at number 74, Rue de la Rene de Maroquinier. As he was turning into the street, Emma herself appeared at the end of it. He threw himself upon her, rather than embraced her, crying, What kept you yesterday? I was not well. What was it? Where? How? She passed her hand over her forehead and answered, At Mademoiselle L'Empereur's. I was sure of it. I was going there. Oh, it isn't worth while, said Emma. She went out just now. But for the future, don't worry. I do not feel free, you see, if I know that the least delay upsets you like this. This was a sort of permission that she gave herself, so as to get perfect freedom in her escapades, and she profited by it freely, fully. When she was seized with the desire to see Lyon, she set out upon any pretext, and as he was not expecting her on that day, she went to fetch him at his office. It was a great delight at first, but soon he no longer concealed the truth, which was that his master complained very much about these interruptions. Pshaw! Come along, she said, and he slipped out. She wanted him to dress all in black, and grow a pointed beard, to look like the portraits of Louis the Thirteenth. She wanted to see his lodgings, thought them poor. He blushed at them, but she did not notice this then advised him to buy some curtains like her, and as he objected to the expense, ah, ah, you care for your money, she said laughing. Each time Leon had to tell her everything that he had done since their last meeting. She asked him for some verses, some verses for herself, a love poem in honor of her, but he never succeeded in getting rhyme for the second verse, and at the last ended by copying the sonnet in a keepsake. This was less from vanity than from the one desire of pleasing her. He did not question her ideas. He accepted all her tastes. He was rather becoming her mistress than she his. She had tender words and kisses that thrilled his soul. Where could she have learnt this corruption almost incorporeal in the strength of its profanity and dissimulation? End of Part 3 Chapter 5 Recording by Bob Sage Part 3, Chapter 6 of Madame Bovary This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Sage. Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert. Part Three, Chapter Five. During the journeys he made to see her, Leon had often dined at the chemist's, and he felt obliged from politeness to invite him in turn. With pleasure, Monsieur Homais replied. Besides, I must invigorate my mind, for I am getting rusty here. We'll go to the theatre, to the restaurant. We'll make a night of it. Oh, my dear, tenderly murmured Madame Homais, alarmed at the vague perils he was preparing to brave. Well, what? Do you think I'm not sufficiently ruining my health living here, amid the continual emanations of the pharmacy? But there, that is the way with women. They're jealous of science, and then are opposed to our taking the most legitimate distractions. No matter. Count upon me. One of these days I shall turn up at Rouen, and we'll go the pace together. The druggist would formerly have taken care not to use such an expression, but he was cultivating a gay Parisian style, which he thought in the best taste, and like his neighbor, Madame Bovary, he questioned the clerk curiously about the customs of the capital. He even talked slang to dazzle the bourgeois, saying bender, crummy, dandy, macaroni, the cheese, cut my stick, and I'll hook it, for I'm going. So one Thursday Emma was surprised to meet Monsieur Homais in the kitchen of Lyon d'Or, wearing a traveler's costume, that is to say, wrapped in an old cloak which no one knew he had, while he carried a valise in one hand and the foot-warmer of his establishment in the other. He had confided his intentions to no one, for fear of causing the public anxiety by his absence. The idea of seeing again the place where his youth had been spent no doubt excited him, for during the whole journey he never ceased talking, and as soon as he had arrived he jumped quickly out of the diligence to go in search of Leon. In vain the clerk tried to get rid of him. Monsieur Homais dragged him off to the large café de la Normandie, which he entered majestically, not raising his hat, thinking it very provincial to uncover in any public place. Emma waited for Leon three-quarters of an hour. At last she ran to his office, and lost in all sorts of conjectures, accusing him of indifference, and reproaching herself for her weakness. She spent the afternoon, her face pressed against the window-panes. At two o'clock they were still at a table opposite each other. The large room was emptying. The stove pipe in the shape of a palm tree spread its gilt leaves over the white ceiling, and near them, outside the window, in the bright sunshine, a little fountain gurgled in a white basement, where, in the midst of watercress and asparagus, three torpid lobsters stretched across to some quails that lay heaped up in a pile on their sides. Ome was enjoying himself. Although he was even more intoxicated with the luxury than the rich fare, the pomar wine all the same rather excited his faculties, and when the omelette au rhum appeared, he began propounding immoral theories about women. What seduced him above all was chic. He admired an elegant toilette in a well-furnished apartment, and as to bodily qualities, he didn't dislike a young girl. Leon watched the clock in despair. The druggist went on drinking, eating, and talking. "'You must be very lonely,' he said suddenly, here at Rouen. "'To be sure your lady-love doesn't live far away.' And the other blush. "'Come now, be frank. Can you deny that at Yonville the young man stammered something? At Madame Bovary's you're not making love to—' "'To whom?' "'The servant!' He was not joking." But vanity, getting the best of prudence, Leon, in a spite of himself, protested. Besides, he only liked dark women. I approve of that, said the chemist. They have more passion. And whispering into his friend's ear, he pointed out the symptoms by which one could find out if a woman had passion. He even launched into an ethnographic digression. The German was vaporish, the French woman licentious, the Italian passionate. "'And negresses?' asked the clerk. "'They are an artistic taste,' said Homais. "'Waiter, two cups of coffee.' 
are we going at last asked leon impatiently ja but before leaving he wanted to see the proprietor of the establishment and made him a few compliments then the young man to be alone alleged he had some business engagement ah i will escort you said homais and all the while he was walking through the streets with him he talked of his wife his children of their future and of his business told him in what a decayed condition it had formerly been and to what a degree of perfection he had raised it arrived in front of the hotel de boulogne leon left him abruptly ran up the stairs and found his mistress in great excitement at mention of the chemist she flew into a passion he however piled up good reasons it wasn't his fault didn't she know homais did she believe that he would prefer his company but she turned away he drew her back and sinking to his knees clasped her waist with his arms in a languorous pose full of concupiscence and supplication she was standing up her large flashing eyes looked at him seriously almost terribly then tears obscured them her red eyelids were lowered she gave him her hands and leon was pressing them to his lips when a servant appeared to tell the gentleman that he was wanted you will come back she said yes but when immediately it's a trick said the chemist when he saw leon i wanted to interrupt this visit that seemed to me to annoy you let's go and have a glass of garousse at brilou leon vowed that he must get back to his office then the druggist joked him about quill drivers and the law leave cajou and bartol alone a bit who the devil prevents you be a man let's go to bridou you'll see his dog it's very interesting and as the clerk still insisted i'll go with you i'll read the paper while i wait for you or turn over the leaves of a code leon bewildered by emma's anger monsieur homais's chatter and perhaps by the heaviness of the luncheon was undecided and as it were fascinated by the chemist he kept repeating let's go to bridou it's just by here in the rue malpalou then through cowardice through stupidity through the indefinable feeling that drags us into the most distasteful acts he allowed himself to be led off to bridou whom they found in his small yard superintending three workmen who panted as they turned the large wheel of a machine for making seltzer water homais gave them some good advice he embraced bridou they took some garousse twenty times leon tried to escape but the other seized him by the arm saying presently i'm coming we'll go to the fanal de rouen to see the fellows there i'll introduce you to thornassin at last he managed to get rid of him and rushed straight to the hotel emma was no longer there she had just gone in a fit of anger she detested him now this failing to keep their rendezvous seemed to her an insult and she tried to rake up other reasons to separate herself from him he was incapable of heroism weak banal more spiritless than a woman avaricious too and cowardly then growing calmer she at length discovered that she had no doubt calumniated him but the disparaging of those we love always alienates us from them to some extent we must not touch our idols the guilt sticks to our fingers they gradually came to talking more frequently of matters outside their love and in the letters that emma wrote him she spoke of flowers verses the moon and the stars naive resources of a waning passion striving to keep itself alive by all external aids she was constantly promising herself a profound felicity on her next journey then she confessed to herself that she felt nothing extraordinary this disappointment quickly gave way to a new hope and emma returned to him more inflamed more eager than ever she undressed brutally tearing off the thin laces of her corset that nestled around her hips like a gliding snake she went on tiptoe barefooted to see once more that the door was closed then pale serious and without speaking with one movement she threw herself upon his breast with a long shudder yet there was upon that brow covered with cold drops on those quivering lips in those wild eyes in the strain of those arms 
something vague and dreary that seemed to Lyon to glide between them subtly, as if to separate them. He did not dare to question her, but seeing her so skilled, she must have passed, he thought, through every experience of suffering and of pleasure. What had once charmed now frightened him a little. Besides, he rebelled against his absorption, daily more marked by her personality. He begrudged Emma this constant victory. He even strove not to love her. Then, when he heard the creaking of her boots, he turned coward, like drunkards at the sight of strong drinks. She did not fail, in truth, to lavish all sorts of attentions upon him, from the delicacies of food to the coquetries of dress and languishing looks. She brought roses to her breast from Yonville, which she threw into his face, was anxious about his health, gave him advice as to his conduct, and, in order the more surely to keep her hold on him, hoping perhaps that heaven would take part, she tied a medal of the Virgin round his neck. She inquired like a virtuous mother about his companions. She said to him, Don't see them. Don't go out. Think only of ourselves. Love me. She would have liked to be able to watch over his life, and the idea occurred to her of having him followed in the streets. Near the hotel there was always a kind of loafer who accosted travelers and who would not refuse. But her pride revolted at this. Bah! So much the worse. Let him deceive me. What does it matter to me, as if I cared for him? One day, when they had parted early, and she was returning alone along the boulevard, she saw the walls of her convent. Then she sat down on a form in the shade of the elm trees. How calm that time had been! How she longed for the ineffable sentiments of love that she had tried to figure to herself out of books! The first month of her marriage, her rides in the wood, the viscount that waltzed, and Lagardy singing, all repassed before her eyes, and Lyon suddenly appeared to her as far off as the others. Yet I love him, she said to herself. No matter. She was not happy. She never had been. Whence came this insufficiency in life, this instantaneous turning to decay of everything on which she leant? But if there were somewhere a being strong and beautiful, a valiant nature full at once of exultation and refinement, a poet's heart in an angel's form, a lyre with sounding chords ringing out elegiac epithalamia to heaven, why, perchance, should she not find him? Ah, how impossible! Besides, nothing was worth the trouble of seeking it. Everything was a lie. Every smile hid a yawn of boredom, every joy a curse, all pleasure satiety, and the sweetest kisses left upon your lips, only the unattainable desire for a greater delight. A metallic clang droned through the air, and four strokes were heard from the convent clock. Four o'clock, and it seemed to her that she had been there on that form an eternity. But an infinity of passions may be contained in a minute, like a crowd in a small space. Emma lived all absorbed in hers, and troubled no more about money matters than an archduchess. Once, however, a wretched-looking man, rubicund and bald, came to her house, saying he had been sent by Monsieur Vincard of Rouen. He took out the pins that held together the side pockets of his long green overcoat stuck them into his sleeve, and politely handed her a paper. It was a bill for seven hundred francs, signed by her, and which Lheureux, in spite of all his professions, had paid away to Vincar. She sent her servant for him. He could not come. Then the stranger, who had remained standing, casting right and left curious glances that his thick, fair eyebrows hid, asked with a naive air, "'What am I to take?' Monsieur Vincar. Oh, said Emma, tell him that I haven't it. I'll send it next week. He must wait. Yes, till next week. And the fellow went without another word. But the next day, at twelve o'clock, she received a summons, and the sight of the stamped paper on which appeared several times in large letters, Maitre Harang, Bailiff at Bouchy, so frightened her that she rushed in hot haste to the line drapers. She found him in his shop, doing up a parcel. "'You're obedient,' he said. 
I am at your service. But Lheureux, all the same, went on with his work, helped by a young girl of about thirteen, somewhat hunchbacked, who was at once his clerk and his servant. Then, his clogs clattering on the shop-boards, he went up in front of Madame Bovary to the front door, and introduced her into a narrow closet, where, in a large bureau in the sapon wood, lay some ledgers, protected by a horizontal padlocked iron bar. Against the wall, under some remnants of calico, one glimpsed a safe, but of such dimensions that it must contain something besides bills and money. Monsieur Lheureux, in fact, went in for pawnbroking, and it was there that he had put Madame Bovary's gold chain, together with the earrings of poor old Tellier, who at last forced to sell out, had bought a meager store of grocery at Quin Campois, where he was dying of catarrh amongst his candles that were less yellow than his face. Lheureux sat down in a large cane armchair, saying, What news? See! Si! and she showed him the paper. Well, how can I help it? Then she grew angry. Reminding him of the promise he had given not to pay away her bills, he acknowledged it. But I was pressed myself. The knife was at my throat. And what will happen now? She went on. Oh, it's very simple. A judgment, and then a distraint. That's about it. Emma kept down a desire to strike him and asked gently if there was no way of quieting Monsieur Vincar. I dare say. Quiet Vincar? You don't know him. He's more ferocious than an Arab. Still, Monsieur Lheureux must interfere. Well, listen, it seems to me so far I've been very good to you. And opening one of his ledgers, See, he said, then running up the page with his finger, Let's see, let's see, August 3rd, two hundred francs, June seventeenth, a hundred and fifty, March twenty-third, forty-six, in April, he stopped as if afraid of making some mistake, not to speak of the bills signed by Monsieur Vauvery, one for seven hundred francs, and another for three hundred. As to your little installments with interest, why, there's no end to them. One gets quite muddled over them. I'll have nothing more to do with it. She wept. She even called him her good Monsieur Lheureux, but he always fell back upon that rascal Vincar. Besides, he hadn't a brass farthing. No one was paying him nowadays. They were eating his coat off his back. A poor shopkeeper like him couldn't advance money. Emma was silent, and Monsieur Lheureux, who was biting the feathers of a quill, no doubt became uneasy at her silence, for he went on, Unless one of these days I have something coming in, I might... Besides, she said, as soon as the balance of bon vie, what? And on hearing that Langlois had not yet paid, he seemed much surprised. Then, in a honeyed voice, and we agree, you say. Oh, to anything you like. On this he closed his eyes to reflect, wrote down a few figures, and declaring it would be very difficult for him, that the affair was shady, and that he was being bled. He wrote out four bills for two hundred and fifty francs each to fall due month by month, provided that Vincar will listen to me. However, it's settled, and I don't play the fool. I'm straight enough. Next, he carelessly showed her several new goods, not one of which, however, was in his opinion worthy of Madame. When I think there's a dress at three pence halfpenny a yard, and warranted fast colors, and yet they actually swallow it. Of course, you understand, one doesn't tell them what it really is. He hoped by this confession of dishonesty to others to quite convince her of his probity to her. Then he called her back to show her three yards of guipure that he had lately picked up at a sale. Isn't it lovely? said Laura. It is very much used now for the backs of armchairs. It's quite the rage. And... More ready than a juggler, he wrapped up the guipure in some blue paper and put it in Emma's hands. But at least let me know. Yes, another time, he replied, turning on his heel. That same evening she urged Bovary to write to his mother, to ask her to send as quickly as possible the whole of the balance due from the father's estate. The mother-in-law replied that she had nothing more. The winding-up was over, 
and there was due to them besides bon vie an income of six hundred francs that she would pay them punctually. Then Madame Bovary sent in accounts to two or three patients, and she made large use of this method, which was very successful. She was always careful to add a postscript. Do not mention this to my husband. You know how proud he is. Excuse me. Yours obediently. There were some complaints. She intercepted them. To get money she began selling her old gloves, her old hats, the old odds and ends that she bargained rapaciously, her peasant blood standing her in good stead. Then, on her journey to town, she picked up knick-knacks second-hand, that, in default of anyone else, Monsieur Lheureux would certainly take off her hands. She bought ostrich feathers, Chinese porcelain, and trunks. She borrowed from Felicité, from Madame Le François, from the landlady at the Croix Rouge, from everybody, no matter where. With the money she at last received from Barneville, she paid two bills. The other fifteen hundred francs fell due. She renewed the bills, and thus it was continually. Sometimes, it is true, she tried to make a calculation, but she discovered things so exorbitant that she could not believe them possible. Then she recommenced, soon got confused, gave it all up, and thought no more about it. The house was dreary now. Tradesmen were seen leaving it with angry faces. Handkerchiefs were lying about on the stoves, and little Bertha, to the great scandal of Madame Homais, wore stockings with holes in them. If Charles timidly ventured a remark, she answered roughly that it wasn't her fault. What was the meaning of all these fits of temper? He explained everything through her old, nervous illness, and reproaching himself with having taken her infirmities for faults, accused himself of egotism and longed to go and take her in his arms. Ah, no, he said to himself, I should worry her, and he did not stir. After dinner he walked about alone in the garden. He took little Bertha on his knees, and unfolding his medical journal, tried to teach her to read. But the child, who had never had any lessons, soon looked up with large, sad eyes, and began to cry. Then he comforted her, went to fetch water in her can to make rivers on the sand-path, or broke off branches from the privet hedges to plant trees in the beds. This did not spoil the garden much, all choked now with long weeds. They owed les de boudoir for so many days. Then the child grew cold and asked for her mother. "'Call the servant,' said Charles. "'You know, dearie, that Mamma does not like to be disturbed.' Autumn was setting in, and the leaves were already falling as they did two years ago when she was ill. Where would it all end? And he walked up and down, his hands behind his back. Madame was in her room, which no one entered. She stayed there all day long, torpid, half-dressed, and from time to time burning Turkish pastilles, which she had bought at Rouen in an Algerian shop. In order not to have at night this sleeping man stretched at her side, by dint of maneuvering, she at last succeeded in banishing him to the second floor, while she read till morning extravagant books full of pictures of orgies and thrilling situations. Often seized with fear, she cried out, and Charles hurried to her. Oh, go away, she would say, or at other times, consumed more ardently than ever by that inner flame to which adultery added fuel, panting, tremulous, all desire. She threw open her window, breathed in the cold air, shook loose in the wind her masses of hair, too heavy, and gazing upon the stars, longed for some princely love. She thought of him, of Léon. She would have given anything for a single one of those meetings that surfeited her. These were gala days. She wanted them to be sumptuous, and when he alone could not pay the expenses, she made up the deficit liberally, which happened pretty well every time. He tried to make her understand that they would be quite as comfortable somewhere else, in a smaller hotel, but she always found some objection. One day she drew six small silver gilt spoons from her bag. They were old Rouault's wedding present, begging him to pawn them at once for her, and Leon obeyed, though the proceeding annoyed him. He was afraid of compromising himself. 
Then on reflection he began to think his mistress's ways were growing odd, and that they were perhaps not wrong in wishing to separate him from her. In fact, someone had sent his mother a long anonymous letter to warn her that he was ruining himself with a married woman, and the good lady at once, conjuring up the eternal bugbear of families, the vague, pernicious creature, the siren, the monster, who dwells fantastically in depths of love, wrote to lawyer Dupocage, his employer, who behaved perfectly in the affair. He kept him for three quarters of an hour trying to open his eyes to warn him of the abyss into which he was falling. Such an intrigue would damage him later on when he set up for himself. He implored him to break with her, and if he would not make this sacrifice in his own interest, to do it at least for his, Dubocage's, sake. At last Leon swore he would not see Emma again, and he reproached himself with not having kept his word. Considering all the worry and lectures this woman might still draw round the stove in the morning. Besides, he was soon to be head clerk. It was time to settle down. So he gave up his flute exalted sentiments and poetry, for every bourgeois and the flush of his youth, were it but for a day, a moment, has believed himself capable of immense passions of lofty enterprises. The most mediocre libertine has dreamed of sultanas. Every notary bears within him the debris of a poet. He was bored now when Emma suddenly began to sob on his breast, and his heart like the people who can only stand a certain amount of music, dozed to the sound of a love whose delicacies he no longer noted. They knew one another too well for any of those surprises of possession that increase its joys a hundredfold. She was as sick of him as he was weary of her. Emma found again in adultery all the platitudes of marriage. But how to get rid of him? Then, though she might feel humiliated at the baseness of such enjoyment, she clung to it from habit or from corruption, and each day she hungered after them the more, exhausting all felicity and wishing for too much of it. She accused Leon of her baffled hopes, as if he had betrayed her, and she even longed for some catastrophe that would bring about their separation, since she had not the courage to make up her mind to do it herself. She nonetheless went on writing him love letters, in virtue of the notion that a woman must write to her lover. But whilst she wrote, it was another man she saw, a phantom fashioned out of her most ardent memories, of her finest reading, her strongest lusts, and at last he became so real, so tangible, that she palpitated, wondering, without, however, the power to imagine him clearly. So lost was he like a god, beneath the abundance of his attributes. He dwelt in that azure land where silk ladders hang from balconies under the breath of flowers in the light of the moon. She felt him near, he was coming, and would carry her right away in a kiss. Then she fell back, exhausted, for these transports of vague love wearied her more than great debauchery. She now felt constant ache all over. Often she even received summonses, stamped papers that she barely looked at. She would have liked not to be alive, or to always sleep. On Midland she did not return to Yonville, but in the evening went to a masked ball. She wore velvet breeches, red stockings, a club wig, and three-cornered hat cocked on one side. She danced all night to the wild tones of the trombones. People gathered round her, and in the morning she found herself on the steps of the theatre together with five or six masks, debardeurs, and sailors, Leon's comrades, who were talking about having supper. The neighboring cafés were full. They caught sight of one on the harbor, a very indifferent restaurant, whose proprietor showed them to a little room on the fourth floor. The men were whispering in a corner, no doubt consorting about expenses. There were a clerk, two medical students, and a shopman. What company for her! As to women, Emma soon perceived from the tone of their voices that they must always belong to the lowest class. Then she was frightened, pushed back her chair, and cast down her eyes. The others began to eat. She ate nothing. Her head was on fire, her eyes smarted, and her skin was ice-cold. 
In her head she seemed to feel the floor of the ballroom rebounding again beneath the rhythmical pulsation of the thousands of dancing feet. And now the smell of the punch, the smoke of the cigars, made her giddy. She fainted, and they carried her to the window. Day was breaking, and a great stain of purple color broadened out in the pale horizon over the St. Catherine Hills. The livid river was shivering in the wind. There was no one on the bridges. The street lamps were going out. She revived and began thinking of Bertha, asleep yonder in the servant's room. Then a cart filled with long strips of iron passed by and made a deafening metallic vibration against the walls of the houses. She slipped away suddenly, threw off her costume, told Leon she must get back, and at last was alone at the Hotel de Boulogne. Everything, even herself, was now unbearable to her. She wished that taking wing like a bird she could fly somewhere, far away, to regions of purity, and there grow young again. She went out, crossed the boulevard, the Place Cauchoise and the Faubourg, as far as an open street that overlooked some gardens. She walked rapidly, the fresh air calming her, and little by little the faces of the crowd, the masks, the quadrilles, the lights, the supper, those women all disappeared like mists fading away. Then, reaching the Croix Rouge, she threw herself on the bed in her little room on the second floor, where there were pictures of the Tour de Nestle. At four o'clock, Hiver awoke her. When she got home, Felicité showed her behind the clock a gray paper. She read, In virtue of the seizure and execution of a judgment. What judgment? As a matter of fact, the evening before another paper had been brought that she had not yet seen, and she was stunned by these words, by order of the king, law, and justice, to Madame Bovary. Then, skipping several lines, she read, within twenty-four hours, without fail, but what? To pay the sum of eight thousand francs, and there was even at the bottom she will be constrained thereto by every form of law, and notably by a writ of distraint on her furniture and effects. What was to be done? In twenty-four hours, to-morrow, Lheureux, she thought, wanted to frighten her again, for she saw through all his devices, the object of his kindnesses. What reassured her was the very magnitude of the sum. However, by dint of buying and not paying, of borrowing, signing bills, and renewing these bills that grew at each new falling in. She had ended by preparing a capital for Monsieur Lheureux, which he was impatiently awaiting for his speculations. She presented herself at his place with an offhand air. You know what has happened to me? No doubt it's a joke. How so? He turned away slowly, and folding his arms said to her, My good lady, do you think I should go on? all eternity, being your purveyor and banker for the love of God? Now be just. I must get back what I've laid out. Now be just. She cried out against the debt. Ah, so much the worse. The court has admitted it. There's a judgment. It's been notified to you. Besides, it isn't my fault. It's Vincar's. Could you not owe oh, nothing whatever? But still, now talk it over and she began beating about the bush. She had known nothing about it. It was a surprise. "'Whose fault is that?' said Lheureux, bowing ironically. "'While I'm slaving like a nigger, you go gallivanting about.' "'Ah, no lecturing. It never does any harm,' he replied. She turned coward. She implored him. She even pressed her pretty white and slender hand against the shopkeeper's knee. "'There, that'll do. Anyone think you want to seduce me? You're a wretch, she cried. Oh, oh, go it, go it. I will show you up. I shall tell my husband. All right, I too. I'll show your husband something. And Lheureux drew from his strong box the receipt for eighteen hundred francs that she had given him when Vincar had discounted the bills. Do you think, he added, that he'll not understand your little theft, the poor dear man? She collapsed more overcome than if felled by the blow of a pole-axe. He was walking up and down from the window to the bureau, repeating all the while, 
Ah, I'll show him. I'll show him. Then he approached her, and a soft voice said, It isn't pleasant, I know. But after all, no bones are broken, and since that is the only way that is left for you paying back my money, but where am I to get any? said Emma, wringing her hands. Bah! When one has friends like you, and he looked at her in so keen, so terrible a fashion, that she shuddered to her very heart. I promise you, she said to sign, I've enough of your signatures. I will sell something. Get along, he said, shrugging his shoulders. You've not got anything. And he called through the peephole that looked down into the shop. Annette, don't forget the three coupons of number 14. The servant appeared. Emma understood, and asked how much money would be wanted to put a stop to the proceedings. It is too late. But if I brought you several thousand francs, a quarter of the sum, a third, perhaps the whole, no, it's no use. And he pushed her gently towards the staircase. I implore you, Monsieur Lerreux, just a few days more. She was sobbing. There, tears now. You're driving me to despair. What do I care? He said, shutting the door. End of part three, chapter six. Recording by Bob Sage.